my name is Jeff Davis. I'm a partner at EY in our EY in our financial services audit practice, and I've really been spending, you know, a little over a year now, um, spending a lot of time looking at stable coins and how you know we as a firm can help enhance trust uh, around these products. And 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 before we get started, I just really need to commend Paul and his team for what you know the incredible summit that they've that they've pulled together today. And I know Paul's alluded to it a few times, but you know, the, the ability to pivot so quickly and put together such a great summit, I think really, really inspiring stuff. Um, not only are the t-shirts inspiring, but um, you know, the way this has been pulled together is inspiring. And thank you uh, for everybody joining us today. Uh, I know, I hope you're all safe and healthy uh, and really excited to, to talk about stable coins. And, and it really is an amazing time to talk about stable coins. I think Lou and Megan, you know, hit on it. But, you know, even if you look at this just this past week, uh, at the end of last week, Libra announcing revisions to their proposed uh, stable coin product. Um, China last week announcing uh, or really launching their pilot uh, of their new digital currency um, and also the Financial Stability Board uh, coming out and providing 10 recommendations to regulator, regulators and issuers um, related to the oversight challenges for uh, global uh, stablecoin arrangements. So really a lot going on in this space. Um, so here's our agenda. So we're gonna spend a couple minutes. So I'll, I'll give a little lay of the land of the stablecoin ecosystem, but really excited that uh, we have a couple of great guest speakers and leaders in this space. So Amy Liu and Namil Dalal from Coinbase and Joao Reganado from, from Circle, who together through the Center Coin Consortium run uh, USD Coin, uh, one of the largest fiat backed stable coins out there. Uh, so, and, and then last but not least, uh, Anna Gosine from EY is gonna spend a few minutes on the accounting considerations for stable coins. So uh, really excited for that discussion as well. And, and it is a packed agenda, but we do, Hope to have a, a couple minutes at the end to, for a little question and answer. So let's let's dive in uh, to the to the stablecoin e ecosystem. But you know, what this and how we got here. Um, so what this really is is a slimmed down version of a uh, a timeline. I think many of you would be familiar with. So thinking about the the blockchain journey back in 0809, uh, following that financial crisis, uh, the launch of launch of Bitcoin and really the possibility of um, cryptocurrency and digital store of value. Um, but what was really exciting was that technology that underpinned it. Um, and since then, we've seen um, experimentation on a massive scale. So thinking about Ethereum and smart contracts, really opening the doors for a myriad of, uh, of different blockchain uh, digital assets. We've seen it move from cryptocurrency payments, supply chain management of wine, as uh, Paul talked about earlier, um, and also tackling the challenges of news transparency as, as the folks from ANSA uh, talked about right before this. So it's really, really been a journey. And now stable coins, or I think uh, Paul coined the term digital assets, formerly known as stable coins, um, are really the next, next big thing. So what are stable coins? Stable coins are, you know, cryptocurrency that ties their market value or their value uh, generally to um, a reference or, or an asset like, like the US dollar or gold or, or oil. Um, and we're also seeing as, as Lou pointed out uh, directly before this, you know, stable coins that are um, pegged to a basket of currencies. Um, and we're also seeing them uh, pegged to uh, a basket of cryptocurrency. So, so really a lot of different um, innovations, innovations going on in the space. Um, you know, a key component of stable coins is, you know, the ability to maintain price stability. So really uh, providing an opportunity for uh, people and organizations to use cryptocurrency to, to pay for things. Um, and um, one of the key components of that is the sufficiency of the collateral um, in a lot of cases that supports that stable coin. So thinking about, you know, you're, you, you've got a, a stable coin backed by the US dollar. So each time you, you buy a, a, that coin, you pay a dollar. When you want to redeem out, you get a dollar. You know, a key component of that is, is the trust inherent in 
uh, in the sufficiency of that collateral. Um, and a lot of organizations, a lot of issuers are are looking to to audit firms like like EY uh, to provide some uh, attestation or assurance over those uh, collateral balances. Um, and what we're seeing in that space is that the frequency of that assurance is becoming uh, more and more frequent, if you will. So you know, quarterly, monthly, um, and and we're certainly seeing a trend to more uh, more timely uh, assurance there. Uh, before we start the, the panel discussion, uh, maybe just some examples of, of where, where we're seeing uh, people using these or starting to use these in some of the innovations. So financial services, so JP Morgan launching their JPM coin, or you know they've been talking about their JPM coin that's gonna be used or primarily used for um, transactions between their large institutional clients. You know, in the tech and social media space, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have heard of uh, Libra. Uh, and if not, you've certainly heard of Facebook. And Libra is really their foray into uh, the digital asset space and, and the stable coin space. And they announced at the end of last week um, some adjustments to their, to their stable coin to be responsive to some regulatory and other stakeholder concerns. The real power here um, and why it's, I think, made such, such a splash is is the network behind Facebook. So the two and a half billion users, immediate access to um, digital payments and, and things of that nature. Governments, and, and Paul's gonna uh, bring on Bob Bench towards the end of the day from the Fed, um, talk a little bit about how uh, digital assets are impacting that space. But you know, China seems to have um, you know, sort of the head start there with their um, you know, digital currency uh, in, in the process of being launched. And then, blockchain native. So, you know, we're going to spend some time uh, now, let's say, and we'll talk to um, the folks from Coinbase and Circle, uh, but, you know, the, the launching of their uh, blockchain-based stablecoin. So, with that, I do want to dive into a panel discussion. Let me stop sharing my screen so we can get a, a full view of our, of our panelists here. Um, so, before we dive into to USDC, I thought, you know, a good opportunity now for, for our panelists to, I mean, tell us a little bit about your backgrounds, how you got to Coinbase and how you got to Circle and, and whatnot. And maybe, maybe Amy, let's, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jeff. And of course, thanks to EY for having me. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Senior Counsel of Global Business Development at Coinbase. And to answer your question, Jeff, uh, my background mainly has been a mix of one, sports and entertainment, spending a lot of time in LA and New York working for companies like Paramount Pictures and Major League Baseball, and to private equity at a big law firm doing a lot of domestic and cross-border M&A work. Now, like everyone else here, I'd heard about crypto and Coinbase um, many years before, but I didn't seriously consider it until early 2017 when a friend sat me down and taught me about Ethereum. And I kid you not, in the same breath, I was so convinced that I downloaded Coinbase and purchased the max amount that my limit will allow of ETH. So down the rabbit hole I went ever since 2017, and I started attending conferences around the world to learn more about this. And at that time, um, I was going to even developer-focused conferences like DevCon, and I remember being one of the only lawyers there. It was just me and the Coin Center guys. And I was very pleased to see last year going to Osaka DevCon that now we form like a small contingency of lawyers. So the space is definitely growing. Um, well, if you can imagine, 2017 was also the year of the ICO boom, uh, where projects were popping up left, right, and center. And so more often than not, uh, entities were setting up offshore in light of sort of the regulatory uncertainty on the mainland here. So I followed the money, as they say, and quit my secure, high-paying law firm gig and moved to the Cayman Islands to consult for a legal boutique uh, specializing in crypto. And that really allowed me to delve head in in a really um, hands-on approach in the space. And the more I learned about it, of course, the more potential I saw and the more excited I got. Uh, so I'm with that offshore experience and moved to the States and joined Coinbase last year. And at Coinbase here, I have a few responsibilities. My purview is everything legal related to uh, one, the institutional sales team, um, dealing with some of our biggest clients across all of our products, whether that be the trading platform, custody, or analytics. Uh, two, asset issuer matters relating to the partners that we work with, the onboard assets. Three, business development deals globally. And then, of course, all stablecoin matters, including USDC and our participation in Libra. Awesome. Namil, how about, how about you? Hi, everyone. I'm Namil. I'm a product manager at Coinbase. I run the USDC team uh, and the crypto teams at Coinbase. 
And I got into finance actually. So I, my first job at a college was at the World Bank in East Timor. Uh, and I was seeing just the, the challenges of early financial services around the world, especially you know, outside the US, outside other developed markets. Um, and after that, I went to work for about three years for large banks in the US, just seeing how they worked, how they operated, the challenges. I spent a lot of time on the IT side and just saw just how many challenges there were uh, because a lot of the US banking system is built on a lot of uh, banking systems over 30, 40 years and mergers and acquisitions kind of cobbled together. Uh, so then I actually had this really great opportunity to be, spend a summer at the Gates Foundation and their financial services team. I was working on remittances, mobile payments, uh, microinsurance, and it just gave you the sense of just how much work there was to be done worldwide in terms of improving uh, financial services access. And then that, the next summer I went um, uh, to India to work actually on mobile payments for microfinance, trying to reduce the cost of microfinance delivery. And here you really saw the, the impediments that came from the higher cost of remittances, right? If you're moving money back and forth, paying a 5% fee or 10% fee is actually a huge deal. Um, especially when fixed costs are often really high. It might be $10 to send as little as $50. Um, so then I actually was in Y Combinator, starting my own company, and I met Brian Armstrong. Brian Armstrong was the, would uh, go on to found um, Coinbase. Uh, and I just got super excited about this idea of open financial systems with Bitcoin at the time. And I think I was excited about Bitcoin, um, and then I got even more excited about Ethereum just because of a lot of programmability. Again, actually, Bitcoin has programmability as well, but they're just ways to make it much more expressive. Um, and so my company was acquired uh, by Coinbase in 2000, uh, 2017, uh, and then I, I joined uh, Coinbase uh, full-time. Now I manage the crypto team, which is all interactions that Coinbase has with the blockchain. So not just Ethereum, not just Bitcoin, but all the other cryptocurrencies that Coinbase adds and interacts with, um, and then USDC, which is our our stablecoin in partnership with the Circle Consortium, with Circle and the Center Consortium. Awesome, great, and Joao, coming 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 to the East Coast, and uh, I know you you joined us last year. Maybe a little bit about your background as well, and we'll then we'll dive in. Sure, I've I've been in tech for. 19, almost 20 years at this point. Um, so very, very varied um, industry background, but uh, but I do share some of the background as Namil mentioned in financial services, even though they were not very long stints, but I have worked in traditional banks in Brazil. I'm originally from Brazil, um, have lived in, in, in Ireland then for 12 years and then eventually the US. And in, in that journey, have worked for financial services banks in Brazil, as I said, and then to, to a big American bank conglomerate over time. But I've done a ton of other things in tech, so I always have a strong bias for, for just automation in general and, and, and improvement on, of tech stack. So I share that, the, the thing that Namil said as well, that if you go, I, I think most people don't appreciate that the banking services and financial services that we use today people knew how old some of the tax stack behind those services are, they, they might choose a different option for where they, where they park their money with. But, you know, fundamentally, customers don't care about technology. That's the way it should supposed to be. We should care about it for them too, so that we can enable better services, right? So over time, um, I moved, I, I really have an engineering and, and software engineering background. Over time, I decided to move more into products. So I did an MBA and that was back in 2011, 2012. And that's when I was introduced to Bitcoin. I had a colleague who basically was not uh, paying attention at all to, to, to business classes and all that he was doing was, uh, was uh, you know, trading Bitcoin. And he got me into that rabbit hole. But I didn't do so much um, about that professionally speaking. Um, up until 2015, when I got a call from somebody at Circle offering me a offering me a job there, and that's that's how I, I then got into crypto professionally. So I've been with Circle for about four and a half years um, on the on the product team. I, I am VP for product for Circle today, um, and um, really really in Circle, then we're sharing the passion that we have about building better technology for representing money. Um, that's, that's how eventually we got to USDC. So, um, you know, we have tried circle has been founded in 2013. So back, back then people really didn't talk about all the alternatives that we have today. And mostly of what we had at the time was Bitcoin. And, uh, and obviously we tried to build financial services that basically operate on top of, of Bitcoin as a, as a better, uh, tax stack for interoperating all of these services together, thinking more like people think in terms of the internet for, for, for sharing data, you know, trying to do the same for financial services, but Bitcoin 
proved over time to not be the ideal solution for that for for many reasons right then similar to what Emil said we we started chasing ethereum and what was happening there because programmability enabled us to do a lot more and then eventually we really realized that uh, you know the concept of stable coins was really interesting if we wanted to really um, rewrite all of our infrastructure and and be sort of uh, blockchain native as far as Technology is concerned, even though you know we, we should abstract that for for consumers because they they really shouldn't care about how their their value is is represented, how the technology is used behind the scenes, and uh, and that's how we got to USCC eventually in 2018, and uh, and then here we are. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, and maybe maybe Namil, coming back coming back to you, um, tell us a little bit about USDC you know, what makes it different and what makes it appealing. I, I know there's been some, you know, I think some particularly high adoption over the last couple of months, given everything that's going on, but maybe, maybe touch on, touch on that. Yeah. And so maybe I'll start with just like high level. We're talking about stable coins and why are stable coins so fascinating? So I think like the, the way I always think about it is the power of fiat and the power of crypto together. So uh, fiat is this amazing thing in that it's stable, it's widely used, it's trusted. Uh, and so we take one of one of those critical pillars, and then we combine that with crypto, which is a global, fast, programmable, cheap. It's open access, like the internet. Um, and so, really, like if you look at the, the growth of, of stablecoins, have been pretty dramatic. Eight billion dollars. Um, the market has grown past that. USDC is at all time highs, so that's 120 million. And I think the that we still have a long way to grow. I think the vision for a lot of people who work on stablecoins or even cryptocurrencies is that how do we make this a larger and larger fraction of the world economy? And how do we have people really benefit from the cheap, uh, fast, uh, programmable layers that this offers? And I think then in that landscape, when I think about USDC specifically, I think the core things that I think about, I think the core, like one thing that is the core at the center consortium and for Coinbase and Circle has been trust and transparency. So for trust, it's that uh, we have a certain process in which to create the contracts, to deploy it. We put our reputation, both Circle and Coinbase, is behind the line when we decide you know, to tell the world that we're supporting this and we're integrating with it. Um, and then I think there's transparency and there's a series of things that we do in terms of audits to ensure that the dollars that we hold, um, it's a dollar-backed stablecoin unlike some others. And so that means that people give us dollars, we put it in a bank account, and then we have uh, someone attest to the fact that those dollars are in the bank account. Uh, and then on the USDC smart contract side, people can see exactly how many tokens are issued. So it leads to just a lot of transparency. I think that's one set of things. The other set of things that I think are really powerful about USDC are easy accessibility. Um, and so Coinbase makes it accessible to 30 million users with our platform. Circle provides these really fantastic and deep APIs for developers to build on, which I think is really critical for this ecosystem to grow. Uh, and then exchanges around the world, because it's an open standard on Ethereum, this ERC-20 standard, crypto exchanges around the world can really attest to it. I think the last thing I would say um, would be that Coinbase has, uh, and Circle have really approached this as a consortium. Um, and so the idea being, if you might see um, other consortiums uh, in an industry, I think the goal here is that a lot of other parties can get involved, they can integrate, um, and this isn't like a single company-led initiative, which I think some stable coins are. Uh, our goal is really that this is open across a number of different parties. They can all contribute in different ways, um, be it developing on top, be it actually being like an issuer uh, of, of the USDC stablecoin. So I would say like, really, if I like think about the three main differentiators for us, trust and transparency, really critical uh, and goes to the heart of what we do. Easy accessibility and doing our best to make it so that people, be they developers or consumers can access them. And then lastly, a consortium so that other parties can get involved uh, and really work collaboratively together to grow this. Wow, that's great. That's great. And, and then maybe, maybe Joelle, from, from your perspective, um, how, do you, how do you look at USTC growing over time? And what are some of the, the use cases that, that you um, see coming, off, coming out of USTC? In your business. Yes, uh, th that's a that's a great thing that I think uh, you know we we humans were definitely not good. I think COVID is now one of those instances. We're definitely not good at imagining the future and and when exactly things might happen, right? But we we all, all that we can do is to look at the data and and see what kind of what kind of inflection points inflection points we're seeing. So definitely, where when USCC was launched. Um, it found product market fit really really quickly into this in in this uh, in this use case that uh that the crypto industry have particularly for investors and traders right which is to to move in and out of, of volatile positions I mean there's a ton of of business and a ton of uh, 
of uh, people um, you know who who have that as a life and and obviously they have access to services like coinbase and 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 others in the world and and they might want to to transfer funds from across these services and uh, just as you transfer funds across different uh, investment uh, services and uh, and stable coins proved to be a real hit for 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 that use case uh, just as it proved to be a real hit for for tether and some of the other alternatives earlier even earlier than ussc and so ussc obviously for all the benefits that Nemil mentioned found found a lot of traction uh, there but we we were always uh, you know certainly more ambitious than than just that use case because as i said we we believe in in blockchain we believe in cryptocurrencies as just a fundamentally better uh, technology for for a lot of the the delivery of financial services so so recently circle has then been operating um you know, from the perspective of, of delivering infrastructure and, and APIs that developers can use to build on top primarily of USCC, but uh, more broadly stable coins. And, and that puts us in a prime position to then look at um, to then look at what people are beginning to to use USCC for. And I have to say, we are really excited to, to have that lens then because, you know, basically all of these developers, all of these businesses are coming to us and saying, we want to build something. And then obviously they try to use our services for that. But it's really interesting to, to hear about that something that they want to build. And I actually have a few notes here just from a couple of, from monitoring a couple of weeks that I wanted to share with you guys. But some of the things that people mentioned they wanted to do, right? I want to be able to issue my invoices in USCC. I want to be able to do global payouts to my publishers in USCC. I want to be able to pay my freelancers in USCC. Uh, I have a need for uh, a, a P2P system that supports USCC. I want to use USCC as a payment option. That's the one that we see the most. I want to pay my suppliers on my supply chain using USCC. So that's just a couple of, you know, I, I, I collected that from, from our system uh, when, we, when we interview these developers and I find that fascinating because uh, you know the 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 word that you actually don't see invariably now as we talk to these developers is crypto you don't see mm. you, you don't see that anymore people are talking about you know global global payments uh, cross border payments you know fast settlement um, they're talking about invoicing they're talking about paying suppliers so so what you really see is a trend here and I think particularly with uh, with what, what's happening in the world, it has sort of accelerated. And, and you also see that, that angle of, in terms of the dollarization of these services. Uh, but we see tremendous demand for, as we always imagine, just using USCC as a different implementation for how you use dollars, right? And a better implementation in many quality attributes as far as speed and cost of transaction and, and, and reach uh, in terms of global, um, Covered. So, so that's fascinating to see. And obviously, in the grand scheme of things, these are very small shoots and these are very early shoots. Um, but we are confident that this is the beginning of an inflection point that is going to mean that stable coins are just, uh, you know, are just a, a real option for, uh, for the financial services infrastructure. No, no, that's really exciting. That's awesome. Um, and maybe, Amy, let's, let's come back to you as we, as we think about some of the challenges, questions you might be getting from customers, regulators, other stakeholders. And I know Namil spent, you know, some, you know, one of his three things was trust and transparency. So, you know, how do, how do you think about that when, um, or like some of the challenges you're getting from, from Yeah, stakeholders? sure. Thanks. Um, so I can tackle regulators and then customer stakeholders um, after that. And then both, I think yeah, you asked a really good question tie into the important sort of um, trust and transparency and assurance question that, that all of these stakeholders fundamentally look for. So with regulators, you have to ask the fundamental questions um, and each of which can open up really a large can of worms. Uh, one of in the jurisdiction that you're operating in, AKA where your customers are, is this a regulated asset? And if so, under what regulation? And then two, on top of that, after you're done with the first analysis, you have to ask whether or not the activity that you're performing, whether it be issuing, buying, selling, lending, distributing, et cetera, changes the answer to the number one, meaning that even if it was unregulated as an asset by category, it could possibly become a regulated asset and or move into another or additional category of regulation. And so if things are not complicated enough, you also know that there's no consensus internationally across all the jurisdictions and the countries. Um, so there's not one regime that we can look to and abide by. Um, it's really multiple. So in the US, for example, states view fiat-backed stable coins differently even. Uh, so we have the fundamental question again 
of is it regulated, for example, under money transmission laws, or is a virtual currency that's regulated in some states, as we've seen in New York with the bit license, or unregulated in others, falling under exceptions or exemptions. And then on the international stage, you really have to consider the different categories of classifications and their implications. Is it e-money, a payment instrument, a debt security, an unrelated, un unregulated crypto asset? So as you can see, it really makes it quite difficult and expensive to design a product that is compliant with laws across the world. Um, and oftentimes there's very little clarity on what exactly those laws are. So we at Coinbase and Center do a lot of time doing our own legal analysis and communicating with regulators whenever there's an opportunity in an effort to be compliant. And this is what makes my job really interesting actually to work on cutting edge matters that have never been explored before. Now, customer wise, so we have retail and institutional customers, of course, and our stakeholders met, uh, run from small businesses wanting to um, provide extra liquidity to their platforms to DeFi developers transacting and building on the ecosystem and many of the players that Joao just mentioned. And these folks really want a stable coin that allows them to unlock their use case in an efficient and safe way. And they also want to ensure that they will be able to redeem a US dollar for that USDC whenever they present it to one of the issuers, right? So trust and transparency and making sure that we actually have those dollars in the reserves um, is fundamental to this entire model. Now we've all seen in the past what can happen when there's a lack of trust, assurance, transparency. I'm sure everyone here on this call recalls a very high profile stablecoin project that resulted in the New York AG's investigation and lawsuit relating to whether or not there are actually reserves. Uh, $850 million reserves went missing and there are allegations of commingling, um, corporate funds used to cover missing funds, um, funds being seized, et cetera. And all of this could have been resolved or at least mitigated by transparent attestations. Mm -hmm. um, however, there was no audit public audit trail that that they could really point to. So hence the current investigation that we're currently in. Um, that said, we at Center uh, have tried to tackle this issue. We believe that transparency to our users, to the regulators, to all of our stakeholders across the board is really, really important. So we publish monthly audit reports and these are published online to the public, um, accessible to anyone that wants them um, on a monthly basis. And they say exactly one, how much USDC is out there, how much is issued and outstanding, and two, how many US dollars are actually held in the banks in our custody accounts. And this audit is conducted by a major accounting firm in accordance with attestation standards established by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Excellent, excellent. And I know, you know, we're coming up and we'll we'll come back with uh, Q and A, but before we move on to Anna quickly, maybe if you each spend, let's say 30 seconds you know, where do we go from here from a stable coin perspective? Um, and, and hopefully you can all stick around after too. And we'll, you know, we've got a couple questions from the audience that, that we want to hit you up with as well. Yeah, and maybe I, Emil, why don't you start? Yeah, absolutely. I think the things that I'm super excited about, um, one is just making things easier to pay. So I think like actually Megan asked a question uh, in, our, in our chat. Uh, and I think like the idea of like making it easier to send uh, money without ETH is an example of something we're excited about, but just generally this idea that, that you can pay at merchants, you can move money back and forth between users just for person to person payments, I think is really powerful and critical. Uh, the other area that I'm super excited about has been decentralized finance and kind of the growth there. I think it's still very nascent. I think John made the point of talking about green shoots and I totally agree. I think we're very in the early innings um, of, of this uh, market, but I think there's some really interesting forms of programmability that will come. And the power of this is that it's not just taking a use case that already exists, it's something, creating something brand new. Uh, and I think there's a power in this of like creating a brand new palette for developers to be able to build apps that we didn't even envision 10, 20 years ago, the same way the internet created a lot of things that we never envisioned before the internet. Awesome. Amy, how about, how about you? Yeah. Um, I've been super excited about stable coins. In the past few weeks, we've been extremely busy and it's been very exciting for the world, not only USDC, but stable coins in general. As an asset class, you mentioned stable coins really saw their market cap grow upwards of 40% in the past few weeks. And importantly, we're seeing this demand in sort of two main ways. Uh, one, a uh, flight to safety sort of in a time of uncertainty by the traditional crypto market players, whether that be traders, miners, retail investors, et cetera and really new inbound interest from non-crypto businesses, as Joao mentioned at the beginning, opening accounts to sort of take advantage of the e-commerce marketplace. 
um, and, and traders wanting to take advantage of, of the market volatility and stable coins are sort of their gateway into, into digital assets. Now, I think many of the changes that we are having to embrace during this sort of crisis period um, will eventually become the new normal. And I think that stablecoin growth and adoption will, will remain one of them um, as people get onboarded onto the platform and ecosystem and see how easy um, this is this as an asset class is to use. Um, stable coins, in my humble opinion, I think are, are have all the qualities of cash, but are better because they're, they're more trusted. There's a capacity, sort of an ability to move globally in a very secure and quick way without the security risks, waiting times, fees associated with the traditional banking system. And as Namil mentioned, they're programmable. So that opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Um, and on the international scale, I'm super excited about the growing interest in stable coins and CBDCs. Uh, this comes on the heels of the release of the Luber White Paper, the Financial Stability Board guidance that you mentioned at the beginning. We see the Bank of France is soliciting proposals for a public-private CBDC partnership. Bank of England is producing CBDC webinars for the public. And then of course, People's Republic, um, Bank of China, potentially releasing the digital yuan, potentially very imminently. So I think that stable coins are here to stay. They're going to continue to grow and sort of um, become a staple in the ecosystem that we operate in. And we're excited to see more action in the space. Awesome. And Joao, if you give us your, th your 30 seconds too. Yeah, I think I agree with everything that Namil and Amy said to, to punctuate what Namil said. I think the, the part that excites me is really the, the new things that, that developers and businesses can build on top of uh, really an infrastructure layer as I see in your SEC. I, th I think in the previous panel towards the end, I, I caught we were saying, you know, there's really a, a drought of stuff to buy with uh, stable coins. And I, and I hope that's not the case for much longer. Uh, but I also hope that, um, you know, consumers, as I said in the beginning, don't don't become aware that they are using USCC, right? I, I really I can't wait for some of the apps um, that people are about to launch on top of our service, where consumers actually don't know that they will be dealing with USCC, and it's going to be beautiful to just have a balance on their app. They they use that to pay for something, or they use that to transfer to somebody else without knowing that it's really USCC in the back end. Awesome, and thank thank you all, um, and hopefully you can stick around for the the Q and A. Um, so now I will we'll come back to the presentation, and and Anna is going to take us through some of the accounting considerations. Go ahead, Anna. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, I'll try to make this quick because I know there's a couple of great questions that we want to ask our, our great panel we have here. Um, so my name is Anna Gosine and I'm the senior manager and EY's national professional practice group. Um, I specialize in the accounting for digital assets amongst other topics. Um, so now that you know what a stable coin is, we had this great discussion. Um, let's talk about the accounting for stable coins. Um, now what Amy was talking about is how it might meet a different definition for regulation purposes. Um, it might meet a totally different definition for accounting purposes. So typically we look at the FASB for um, guidance on how to account for different financial instruments or you know, whatever, just general US GAAP. So right now there's no US GAAP guidance specifically addressing digital, digital assets, whether that's gonna be cryptocurrency, tokens, stable coins or something else. So obviously there's questions about how do we apply our current GAAP to these stable coins. And as we mentioned earlier, stable coins don't have a true definition and people kind of use that term loosely. So I'm gonna go through a couple of examples, one example that's just gonna kind of keep it plain vanilla um, that we kind of see the most common use stable coin. So let's um, go on to the next slide, please. All right, to start the process to determine the appropriate accounting for the stable coin, um, whether that's going to be on the issuer side or the holder side, we want to ask ourselves a few questions um, that are really important to answer. So the first one would be, what's the purpose of the stable coin and how does it achieve that purpose? Um, who's the issuing entity or the group of entities pooling the resources to support the stable coin? Um, really important, what are the rights of the holder and what are the obligations of the issuing entity? And then, of course, what's the asset that's the collateral? Is it fiat currency? Is it a commodity like gold? Or is it another cryptocurrency or crypto asset or group of crypto assets? Um, if it's redeemable, how often can it be redeemed? And are there significant barriers to redemption like fees? Um, does the stable coin actually represent ownership in a legal entity? 
again, none of these considerations by themselves um, are going to determine what your appropriate accounting is. So these are just kind of data points that you want to look at collectively. Um, let's move on to our example. Next slide. Okay. So I'm going to go over what I call a really simple example. Um, really commonly used example, really. Um, so let's take a stable coin, which is issued by an entity who is not a bank. Um, the holder gives us one US dollar to the stable coin issuer in return for one stable coin. The issuer then puts the dollar into a segregated bank account and that serves as the collateral backing the stable coin. Um, the stable coin is then put into the holder's wallet and of course the holder can do what they please with it. That includes redeeming it, redeeming it back for their dollar, they can sell it on an exchange or they can transfer it to another party. So if they transfer it to another party, like maybe say to pay for a cup of coffee or you know wh whatnot or pay for services or goods, um, it's also going to transfer the rights and obligations as well. Um, in our case, the collateral, which is the US dollar, it's going to be fully reserved and its use is going to be restricted by the issuer because it's in a segregated bank account. Um, and then let's further assume that the stable coin is not considered legal tender anywhere within any jurisdiction and we're going to ignore the fees. So let's explore maybe the different accounting models that we might contemplate. Next slide. Okay. So because our stable coin in this, our, our example is redeemable for cash, it's going to meet the definition of a financial instrument in US GAAP. So this is unlike our uncollateralized cryptocurrency like Bitcoin that we treat as a non-financial asset or an intangible asset for accounting purposes. So let's ask ourselves, why is this a financial instrument? Um, in US GAAP, a financial instrument is cash, an ownership interest in an entity, or a contract that imposes an obligation to deliver cash or a right to receive cash or another financial instrument. So in our example, it's clear from the rights and obligations that the stable coin represents a contractual obligation um, of the issuer to deliver cash and a right by the holder to receive cash. So now that we've established that it actually represents a financial instrument, um, we want to ask ourselves, well, what kind of financial instrument is it? Is it a receivable? Is it a debt security? Is it an equity security? That's an important question and distinction to, to determine because that'll have different accounting implications. Um, in our example, the stable coin likely meets the definition of a security, but because it doesn't actually represent an ownership interest in the entity, it's gonna be a debt security instead of an equity security. So um, as a debt security, it's accounted for under ASC 320. On the issuer side, um, because it's an obligation by the issuer to transfer cash upon the holder's redemption, it's going to represent a financial liability. So the issuer would debit cash, credit financial liability. And in this case, it would be a current liability because the holder can redeem it at any time at their discretion. And also the cash is probably likely going to be classified as restricted because its use is restricted and it's segregated in its own bank account. So one question that may come up and is coming up lately is why, why can't the stable coin be classified as cash or cash equivalent? I just want to dive into that issue really quickly because I know we're running up on time. Um, the general view is right now, given the nascent stages of nascent nature and the immature market of stable coins, it's hard to really call it and represent cash because right now it's not you know, consistent with common usage. It's not the standard medium of exchange. It's not the basis for measuring and accounting all financial statement elements. And because it can't be widely used to settle business debts at this time, it's not, we're not completely comfortable calling it cash or cash equivalent. Another reason is our example, we said it wasn't issued by a bank or regulated financial institution. That's an important distinction because um, financial institution, although it's not kind of a specific definition in US GAAP, the general view is that financial institutions in the context of the definition of cash are going to be entities that are subject to rigorous banking regulations or broker dealer regulations or money transmitter regulations. And all of these regulations are designed with the intent to protect and enhance the depositors kind of ability to transact with their balance in a manner that's consistent with cash. 
So um, there's basically no risk of nominal loss at this point. So um, moving on to kind of cash equivalent, although in, the, in US GAAP it's um, defined as it's readily convertible to known amounts of cash and so near the maturity that they present insignificant risk of changes in value. Um, again, because the stable coin is just largely untested and not in the nascent nature of the immature market, and it's, it just kind of poses right now, not the same comparability to liquidity investments that are classified as cash equivalents. So outside of our example here, different stable coins, depending on their rights and obligations, are going to have different accounting implications. For example, you may have one that's a um, financial instrument containing an embedded derivative, and you have to account it under ASC 815. Um, it may be a receivable, like you said, and we account for it under ASC 310. Um, it also could be just a, an equity investment if it represents um, a security, an equity security in an entity. Um, if that's the case, you might have to consider equity method investments or even consolidation, depending on how much of the stable coin that the holder has. Just want to stress really quickly that the accounting is completely driven by the specific facts and circumstances and the terms and obligations of the holder and the issuer. Um, and they're all just largely different. So it's really important, although we talked about one kind of common example, I think each one is going to have a, a unique answer. So it's really important to kind of understand that and it's going to apply a lot of judgment given the fact that there's no current US gap on this. So I'm going to turn it back to Jeff to hopefully get in at least one good Q&A before we have to drop. Thank you, Anna, that's great. And um, you know, us accountants love innovation because it creates additional complexities and challenges we got to solve from, a, from an accounting perspective. And um, so maybe, maybe we have time for one, maybe two questions and, and got an interesting, a couple interesting ones around public chain versus private chain. And then also a, a question around, you know, how you guys think about privacy and when you're when you're thinking about USDC um, and so I'm hoping uh, Namil or Je you know one of you could uh, touch on touch on that topic yeah absolutely this is Namil um, which uh, which is the first question so like how, how do you guys think about well the first question was are all uh, the, the question itself was around whether the you know uh, stable coins are all on public chains versus private chains and then, you know, separately to that, it's somewhat related. But, you know, how do you guys at USDC think about privacy? So I think that, that first question, is, it's a core, I think, that goes to the heart of center. I think our general belief has always been interoperability. Yeah. That we have the openness to use this on any chain. It's not like we have our own chain. Uh, we have a, uh, and so I think we're very open to this being used across different chains. We started on Ethereum because we think that's where there's just tremendous amount of developer interest. Uh, it was one of the chains that just has a lot of usage and has great programmability elements. But I think we're very open to others being able to uh, either issue on other chains directly or figure out other ways to do bridges across the different chains. Uh, generally speaking, I think like our belief has been in an open blockchain world, uh, that, that there are open blockchains. Uh, but again, I think that the goal of this is that it's a primitive that anyone can build on top of. So if there's a way to be able to use it on a private blockchain, that's up to whatever organization that wants to build on top of it to be able to do. Great. Um, and then for privacy, maybe I can have Joao uh, kind of provide some feedback there. Yeah, what's the, what's the angle again on privacy? So I guess how, how you're thinking about, um, you know, privacy on, uh, with respect to USDC. Yeah, we, we get, yeah, we get asked, uh, just, just, I just wanted to confirm that it was that angle. The, um, we, we have, we have been asked that uh, a little bit more often as of lately and uh, then, then say in the last two years. And I guess it's because we now see, at least from our circle perspective, we now see a ton of financial services um, use cases trying to trying to use USDC as a piece of infrastructure. And then people say, you know, we might not want our transactions to be publicly, uh, you know, available um, on 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 Ethereum, at, at least as far as the amounts and 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 things like that. So we don't that we don't have a we don't have a straight up answer for that. Uh, as Namil said, one of the things that we have been investigating in the in the recent uh, past is how how USCC as a, as an asset can function in multiple blockchains. 
And, uh, and to me, that's one of the possible answers is that is how, you know, you can leverage uh, a ton of a ton of existing technology that is there to protect the privacy of some transactions in, in public blockchains and how that can be used in conjunction with USCC. Um, so, th so that's probably the direction we would go. But it's, it's one of the topics that we that we that we have been beginning to discuss in the in the technical committee at Center, but it's very early days, and I, I, we, we are far from having an answer to that right now. Oh, great. Well, we are we are up on time, and uh, I want to thank thank you all for for joining us today and for this great panel. And I guess we'll hand it back to Paul. Wow! Thank you guys so much. That was an amazing panel discussion. I loved it, and especially Anna. You, you really nailed in on what I think is one of the most important questions for me, which is why can't this yet be considered as cash? So thank you all very much. We are back with our celebrity guests. And what I would like to do is just start with our, our two experts, uh, first Lou and then Megan, and just give us your reactions and your thoughts about kind of what we saw in the last panel. Sure, uh, it was super interesting discussion. Um, all, all the panels were really terrific. Um, yeah, I, I, a few thoughts that I had, you know, one, obviously there's a lot of focus on trust and transparency. Uh, and if you go to the Circle site and, and take a look, you could see that you know, they had $693 million in coins outstanding and $693.6 .6 in deposits. Uh, and by the way, that was up 50% over the, the prior month. So, so growing fast. Um, but it's also important to realize that, you know, that that, that what, what drives trust is, isn't that they have the money in the bank, actually. It's, it's that the next guy is gonna take it. Um, and, and in my view, the most fascinating, mind-blowing thing in the three years I've been 24-7 uh, in this space is when Tether came out, wasn't back to dollar to a dollar, only had 75 cents, and the market didn't care because the market believed that the next guy was still gonna accept it as a dollar. Um, you know, the, the stuff to buy, um, you know, I think uh, today, uh, the problem is much more one of on-ramping and, and UX than it is uh, the fact that there isn't a, a, a stable coin to buy stuff. Uh, one of the things that I really agreed with was the programmable stuff, and that's what I think is, is most amazing, uh, and the innovation to come, um, you know, that it's going to be a lot more than just a dollar. Um, it's going to be all kinds of new things you're going to be able to do, although, you know, there was talk on DeFi, which I'm super excited about, but funny to think about something centralized being an integral part of DeFi, which is decentralized finance. And then finally, you know, they, they finished talking about privacy. Um, you know, and there's certainly a lot of solutions in terms of like zero knowledge proof uh, that you can use to, to mass that. What I'm more concerned out about though is, is, is the surveillance and, and the government um, now knowing all these things. You know, you know in, in China, uh, they actually uh, most recently we're actually going to the homes of people who had recently bought flu medicine to check them for COVID, right? So the surveillance issues that can come up are really, really massive. Megan, why don't you kind of share us your initial thoughts as well? And, and just by the way, you're, you're just killing me on the t-shirts. You're so, yours are way better. Uh, well, you know, I work in accounting, right? Very Ledger is an accounting software and I never had the opportunity to wear these shirts. So. I'm very excited about it. And I chose my audit shirt for this session. So auditability for stable coins is paramount, right? So whether or not they're algorithmically backed or they are, you know, we're, we're trusting a, a third party attestational service, auditing is key. It's most, one of the most important things in ensuring the stable coin network infrastructure. Um, so really appreciated the panel's um, focus on that. Um, I believe Amy, you know, touched on it, uh, you know, quite a bit, pretty thoroughly. Um, really like vibed with Amy's uh, sort of journey. I thought it was very similar to mine where, you know, back in the day I started going to these developer heavy conferences and I'm not a software engineer and then sort of moving into the crowd of your, your own uh, uh, sort of people, right? And, and so I, right, similar to Amy, she has her lawyer crowd. I now have my bookkeeper accountants crowd, which I love. Um, one of the things, you know, we, it was touched on before, you know, uh, the, the sort of 
trajectory of stable coins, you know, in, in my opinion, and I think the panel touched on it as well, is moving, uh, you know, creating a tool to hedge out of risk, right, when cryptocurrency markets were really just about speculative trading. Um, so, you know, back in the day, I remember trading with the Circle Trading Desk, uh, and when, you know, uh, stable coins came out, it was like a real, like, lifesaver because we could hedge out of our positions. And, you know, it's now moved into this, you know, totally different animal, which is exciting to see. Um, you know, this idea that stable coins, you know, should be something for wider adoption, you know, really important, as was mentioned, we still have these issues where people who have stable coins need to maintain ETH to pay gas, right, at least for stable coins on the Ethereum network. Um, there's been great work with meta transactions, the gas station network, um, to sort of put the onus back on the application developers to help their users pay for, pay for their transaction fees. Um, so it's fascinating, right, when you think about these networks from, from a macroeconomic perspective, um, how, how those sort of like little levers are, are starting to shift uh, and, and enhance usability. Um, also, you know, really appreciated the accounting deep dive, right, because this is the world that I live in. Um, and to maybe offer a counter perspective, you know, and I, I certainly work with a different type of clientele. I work with entrepreneurs who are you know, starting very young businesses that are really, you know, sort of at the cutting edge of inventing some of this technology. Um, and we, we do work with some crypto enabled businesses where the only time that they touch fiat is to pay taxes. Um, so, you know, it's fascinating to see how these, you know, different narratives are going to be converging and obviously counting rules move very, very slowly. Um, so appreciate the work that EY is doing in, in sort of translating a uh, gap into, you know, what's happening on the ground. It's really, really challenging. And I think that, uh, that our audit teams, our professional practice group are, are doing really good work. I think uh, one of the things I'd love for you to touch on a little bit is how do you think eventually we're going to be able to, or should we be able to tell the difference between an asset backed stable coin with dollars in the bank versus something that's a bit more algorithmic, right? I, I have a hypothesis that many enterprises will, will want to start with the asset back because that will make them feel more comfortable. What's it going to take to get them comfortable with the algorithmic flavor as well? Yeah, well, I, I have some thoughts on this, um, which are, you know, the, the fr from a back office reporting perspective, you know, the sort of um, like, uh, you know, opaqueness with dealing with algorithmic stable coins is a little bit of a risk issue. So it's the, to the extent that these issuers of algorithmic based stable coins can penetrate and be like the first, you know, people moving into these new areas of securities laws, um, I think it would help, you know, more mature businesses be okay with using algorithmic stable coins. Um, one of the things particularly I think about with MakerDAO, right, which is very popular algorithmic stable coin and, and their release of multi-collateral DAI is, you know, in at least to, to my knowledge, there's not really a, 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 a sort of solid process for unfolding those, those additional assets into their basket outside of voting, right? Um, and so I, I would like to see, you know, a little bit more of a sort of structure come in to think about, okay, if we're going to be putting assets into this basket, what is the framework for it? How do we ensure that the community has input, but how do we also make sure that you know, this stable coin is actually going to stay stable. We don't want to be loading up that uh, basket of assets with, you know, assets that aren't worth anything. So it's, it's certainly dangerous. Um, and I think there's a long way to go in terms of regulatory, regulatory approvals and also, um, you know, frameworks from the community to, to make these things more safe. Fantastic. Hey, Lou, I have a question for you. Why don't you think we see any of the world's big global banks issuing stable coins? It's all startups right now. What's it going to take for the world's big leading banks to, for us to have kind of branded bank led stable coins on the public blockchains? You know, I, I think there's still so much uncertainty around regulations uh, and how different governments are going to approach this. Uh, you know, uh, I think we're going to obviously see probably China be the first huge government to come out uh, with, you know, a, a digital currency. Uh, and I think that's going to be a huge on ramp uh, for much of the world. It'll be interesting, obviously, when Libra comes out, um, backed by Facebook, uh, a lot of people back Facebook, um, or a lot of people trust Facebook, but also a lot of people don't trust the government. A lot of people don't trust Facebook. Who, who do they trust? You know, the, the, the institution actually that people trust the most, far more than banks, is people trust their uh, religious institution. They trust their church, right? So, you know, in my mind, if you, you, know, you wanna get something out there that people are really gonna trust, 
you know, you know, is our religions, our churches going to start issuing dollars, um, you know, or, or issuing stable coins, you know, now that it's an open. I'm going to have to file away that. I'm going to have to file away that question for my chat later with Bob Bench, right? Maybe the Federal Reserve needs to get set up in churches, perhaps. <laughs> Yeah, look, um, you know, the, uh, you know, I think MakerDAO is amazing. And MakerDAO is hopefully on the path to decentralization. A lot of what, you know, crypto, and I thought it was funny in an earlier discussion, he said, you know, we're not using the word crypto anymore as though that's a, a bad word, even though it's obviously just short for cryptography, which all of this uh, uh, deploys. But again, kind of pointing to the moment in time where we're at. Um, and because we're early, we're seeing issues uh, with uh, the, the, things like MakerDAO that are more decentralized. And so, you know, hard to imagine this becoming massively mainstream until more of those issues on the decentralized front at least are, are worked out. Megan, I wanted to circle back to something that you said, which I, I thought was really interesting. You know, uh, Luke's got this vision of who can be trusted. Um, you brought up something that we hear a lot from our clients all the time, which is, uh, I want to do things in blockchain transactions. I want to do things with privacy. And I just don't want to hold any form of cryptocurrency or crypto asset. I have, you know, rules or, or just an inhibition. How do we, when do we get past this point? Or when is there sufficient infrastructure where I don't need to touch any crypto in order to use dollar tokens, euro tokens, yen tokens in my business transactions. Because believe it or not, for a number of our clients, that's a stumbling block. And as soon as we can get past that, I think they'll speed up their deployment of blockchain-based applications. Yeah, certainly. I th and I totally understand why companies have that sort of reservation. Um, you know, the custodianship panel that's coming up will hopefully, you know, bring more insight into that. Um, I think fundamentally, right, when you're interacting with public chain assets, right, you we do want these companies to eventually get comfortable with holding their own assets, right? Otherwise, the, the, the sort of innovation of the, the true public chain is, is sort of lost. Um, custodians are certainly provide an important service there. Um, and, you know, to the extent that we can see innovation, right, in, in how custodians actually hold their assets, I think that'll be, um, you know, a good thing for the environment, a good thing for their clients. Um, but, you know, the, the abstraction away from crypto assets, from, you know, the benefits of the network, you know, has moved far forward quite quickly over the past, you know, just 12 months. So I think we'll continue to see, to see that, especially, you know, excited to see what some of EY's clients come out with on that. You know, the, the, the question of when things go mainstream is obviously a difficult one. Um, my first company was the top level domain .tv and we were the largest streamer of video in 2000, except for the experience of streaming video in 2000 was not very good because the pipes weren't fat enough. Fast forward five years, uh, there were a couple tiny companies that were allowing people to upload videos and stream it. And then one day somebody uploaded a video called Lazy Sunday um, onto a, a website called YouTube. And that day YouTube became the fastest growing website in the history of the internet. Six months later, Google bought it for 1.5 billion. Uh, so, you know, in, in my view, we have all these brilliant people working on all of these amazingly innovative products. Uh, and, you know, we're just sitting around kind of waiting for our lazy Sunday uh, moment in, um, you know, in, in crypto and, you know, for stable coins and, and everything uh, in terms of digital assets. So I believe one of the other remaining big barriers is privacy. So lightning around before our next uh, discussion. Uh, quickly, uh, what do you think, where, how quickly do all these stablecoin issuers need to get to something that runs under zero knowledge proofs and allows for, for private transactions? Because I just don't think any enterprises are going to touch stuff that's public. Uh, I, I, I completely agree with you. And, uh, you know, I, I know that E&Y is working with some of the leaders uh, in, in zero knowledge proof uh, uh, to help that adoption. Uh, and, you know, it's probably not today or tomorrow. But I think it's, it's pretty close. The technology is really amazing. It was invented in Israel 40 years ago, and this is really the first commercial use of it. Yeah, I would say critically important, obviously. Otherwise, all of these transactions just become a tool of the state. Uh, but to pose a question, can you have that? Can you have true private transactions with cross-chain interoperability? I don't see how, but we'll be curious. Maybe, maybe I'll learn something different. <laughs>